Who owns the internet? Some people say Google, some say Elon Musk, others think governments. But let me ask you, if the internet had one owner, how could I send a message from Turkey to Kenya in seconds, when no single company provides internet in both countries? If one company owned the internet, how could a person in France watch a live stream from tiny island in Pacific that uses completely different providers? If one company owned the internet, how could a message travel from Germany to China instantly, even though the two countries regulate and control internet access very differently? Here's the truth. Nobody owns the internet, but at the same time, everybody owns a piece of it. And that's where it gets really interesting. Today, we are going to break this mystery down. Not with boring theory, but with real example. I'll show you the companies, the cables, the secret buildings, and the big powers behind the internet. And I want you to tell me in the comments, who do you think should own it? The companies, the governments, or the people? Internet history. Before we talk about who owns the internet today, let's step back. How did it all begin? Because the story of the internet tells us why nobody really owns it. Back in the 1960s, the United States military wanted a network that could survive even if one part was destroyed. This was during the Cold War. So they created a research project called ARPANET. It connected a few universities and military labs with big heavy computers. If one computer failed, the packet found another way. That idea is the heart of the internet today. Then in the 1970s, two smart guys, Green Surf and Bob Kahn, designed TCP IP. This became the common language for computers. With TCP IP, different networks could finally talk to each other. Imagine people from different countries suddenly learning one shared language. That was a huge moment. In the 1980s, the internet started growing beyond the military. More universities joined, the first domain names were created, emails started spreading. At this point, it was still small, but the idea was alive. No central boss, just connected networks. Then came the 1990s, the big boom. The World Wide Web was invented by Tim Berners-Lee. Suddenly, people could click on links, visit websites, and share documents. Companies started offering internet access to homes, dial-up modems that noisy beep beep sounds. Uh, some of you remember, right? Let's check in the comments. So the internet was out of the labs and into the people's living rooms. In the 2000s, broadband replaced dial-up. Speeds got faster, more people connected, Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc. Suddenly, internet was not just information, it was business shopping, social life and so on, but still no single owner. It was millions of small and big networks connected together. By the 2010s, smartphones put the internet in everyone's pocket. Apps, streaming video calls, the internet became daily life. Under the sea, thousands of fiber cables carried traffic between countries. Data centers are established everywhere. And big tech companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Google became the giant's cloud providers. And today, in the 2020s, the internet feels invisible. You just expect it to work. But behind the scenes, it's still the same design from the 60s. No single owner, just many parts connected. That's why the question is so powerful. Who owns the internet? From day one, the answer has always been Nobody fully, but everyone has a piece. The myth of one owner. Interesting point is, some players control very large and important parts of it. That's why you often hear people say things like Google owns the internet or China, US controls the internet, etc. They don't own everything, but their influence is huge. So instead of asking who owns the internet, the real question is who controls the biggest pieces? And to understand that, we need to start with the most physical part the undersea cables that carry data between countries and continents. Submarine cables. When you send a message across the world, it feels like it's flying through the air. In reality, almost all of it. More than 95% of the global internet traffic travels through the fiber optic cables laid on the bottom of the oceans. These submarine cables are the invisible highways of the internet. The first undersea cable was laid in 1858 not for the internet, but for the telegraph between the US and Europe. Today, there are more than 400 active submarine cables stretching over 1.4 million kilometers. It's enough to circle the Earth more than 30 times. Some cables are legendary. The Maria cable, built by Microsoft and Facebook, runs between Virginia, US and Bilbao, Spain. It can carry 200 terabits per second. That's like streaming 100 million HD movies at once. Another is the To Africa cable currently being deployed by Meta and Partners, which will be one of the longest in the world, looping around the entire Africa continent. Submarine cables are surprisingly fragile. They are often as thin as a garden hose, and most breaks come from the ship anchors or even shark bites. 
When they snap, repair ships have to pull them up from the ocean floor, sometimes thousands of meters deep, splice them and carefully drop them back down. What's also fascinating is who owns them. While governments used to dominate, today big tech companies like Google, Meta, Amazon and Microsoft are some of the largest investors. Why? Because controlling these cables mean controlling massive amounts of global data traffic. So, the next time you watch a video from the other side of the planet, remember, it probably travels across the bottom of the ocean, along a cable you will never see. But without it, the internet as we know today, it wouldn't exist. Here is a crazy story. In 2008, a ship's anchor cut a major undersea cable near Egypt, intense law for 75 million users in Middle East and India. Just one accident showed how fragile this really system is. Think about it. If one company owns the road, they can decide the speed, the toll, and even who can use it. Question for you. Should companies like Google own the cables that connect entire continents, or should it be governments? Let's discuss in the comment section. ISPs and big carriers. Okay, cables connect the continents, but once data hits land, it goes through ISPs, intense service providers. The internet works like a giant ladder of networks. At the very top, we have tier one ISPs. These are the biggest players, sometimes called the backbone of the internet. They have networks that span across continents and they connect directly with each other. Because of this, they can reach every corner of the internet without paying anyone else. Below them are tier two ISPs. They are big as well, but not everywhere. They usually buy access from tier one providers and also connect with other tier twos. Finally, we have access ISPs, sometimes called tier three. These are the providers you and I actually pay every month. The companies that bring the internet into our homes and phones. They connect to tier two or tier one networks so that your message can travel anywhere in the world. So when you send a message to another country, it might start on your home Wi-Fi access ISP, hop onto a regional network tier two, and then travel across a backbone provider tier one before reaching your friends ISPs on the other side. The magic of the intent is that all these layers work together. And that's why you can go from your small local connection to anywhere on the world in seconds. So when you pay your home internet bill, you are really paying your ISP, who then connects to bigger ISPs, who then connect to global cables and so on. This is why some people say ISPs own the internet, but do they really? They own your access, yes, but they don't own the whole thing. Still, here is the scary part. If a government tells an ISP to block something like YouTube or Facebook or WhatsApp, your internet feels broken. So is that ownership or is that control? That's a thin line. For example, in 2008, Pakistan Telecom tried to block YouTube inside the country, but they accidentally leaked the YouTube IP prefixes to their upstream provider. Result? YouTube went down across the globe for a few hours. Maybe some of you remember that. Definitely write in the comment, please. Also, I want to hear from you. Do you think ISPs should have the power to cut or filter traffic? Or should the internet be free no matter what? Internet exchange point, IXPs. Now, here is something many people don't know. The internet doesn't flow in one straight line. Networks have to meet somewhere. That's where Internet Exchange Point or IXPs come in. Imagine a huge airport where flights from many airlines connect and IXP is the same, but for data. Google traffic means ISP traffic, university traffic means government traffic, all in one big neutral hub. Neutral IXP is another topic, long the technical discussion. Let me cover that in the, another video next time. So these IXPs are in special buildings in big cities like Frankfurt, London, Singapore, Moscow, and so on. Big IXPs like DKX in Frankfurt or Lynx in London handle huge traffic. We are talking about terabits of traffic. So who owns the internet here? Nobody fully. Each network pays to connect and they all agree to share traffic. I can and domain names. Okay, let's talk about something you use every day. Domain names like google.com, youtube.com, facebook.com. All of these are managed by a non-profit body called ICANN. They don't own the internet, but they control the naming system. Think of ICANN as the phone book of the internet. If they delete a name, it's gone. If they approve a new domain like XYZ or AI, suddenly it exists. By the way, years ago, governments argued about who should run ICANN. The US had big influence for a long time. Now it's more international, but still politics are there, of course. So here's the question. If one body can decide domain names, do they partly own the internet 
Or is that just administration? Governments. Now, we cannot skip governments. In some countries, the government can shut down the internet. They can order ISPs to block apps, slow down traffic, or even cut the whole internet. Think about China with the Great Firewall. The government doesn't own every cable or website, but all internet traffic going in or out of the country travels through the checkpoints they control. At those checkpoints, they can block certain websites like Facebook, Twitter or Google and slow down or filter the rest. For example, if you are in Beijing and try to open YouTube, the request never makes it out. It stopped at the gate. Inside China, people use local services like WeChat or Baidu instead. So the government doesn't own the whole internet, but by controlling that gate, they can decide what people see and don't see. Or countries that block Twitter, WhatsApp or YouTube during protests. Unfortunately, this happened many times in my home country as well. Do you know where I am from? So in these cases, the government doesn't own the cables or the technology, but they control the gate where all the intent traffic travels. And when you control the gate, it almost feels like you own the whole network. So now the big question, should governments have this power or should the intent be free and neutral for everyone? Big tech companies and the cloud. Finally, let's look at the giants, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Meta. They own cloud platforms like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, and guess what? A huge amount of the world's internet apps run on them. For example, Netflix uses Amazon AWS, many banks use Microsoft Azure, even small apps you love, they run on Google Cloud. So if one cloud company goes down, half of the internet can feel broken. That's massive power. That's why some people say big tech companies own the internet. Do you agree? Should we worry that only a few companies have so much of our digital life? Comment what do you think? Is this good efficiency or dangerous monopoly? So, who owns the internet? Is it the companies who build the cables? The ISPs who give you the access? The IXPs where the networks meet? The governments who control the gates? Or big tech companies that have these apps that we use daily? The answer is strange. Nobody owns it but everybody controls a piece of it. The internet is powerful because no single person or country can own it at all. But at the same time, that makes it fragile. One cable cut, one policy change, one giant cloud provider outage, and millions of people feel it. So, let me ask you this. If you had the power, who would you give control of the internet to? Governments, companies, or the people? I want to hear your thoughts in the comments. And hey, if you enjoyed this breakdown, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and make sure notifications are on so you don't miss the next internet discussion, because we are just getting started. Enjoy studying with Orhanagon.net.